you, Lord God. We give you glory and honor this morning. We recognize your splendor. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. How you change us. How you reveal Jesus to us. We have nothing without you. We have nothing without your presence. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would reveal Jesus to us this morning. That he would come off the page and into our hearts. ESV version, John chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 30 through 47 to you. Thank you, Lord. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sit to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? And do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe our words? Father, we give you glory. Thank you for sending us, Lord, the living word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Thank you for your written word that reveals the heart, your heart, Lord. Reveals the heart of your son. You revealed yourself through your son to us, and we're forever grateful for that. And we pray, Lord God, that you would reveal your hearts to us here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. I really wasn't planning on doing this, but this morning as I was reading verse 30, if you could put verse 30 back up there, the Lord kind of started just to speak to me about verse 30. And really my message is about Jesus. As a matter of fact, if I, I think I titled it, I think, let me see what I titled this message. So I don't want to tell you something that's not true. Jesus and the ears. I know, different kind of title, but that's the title. Jesus and the ears. But in this, and so really my message is about Jesus this morning. I really don't want to talk about anything but Jesus. Jesus and his work and Jesus who he is and what he's done and his love and his 
compassion and His grace and His mercy. And his, he's been so good to me. Amen. But when it says I can do nothing on my own, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And I was thinking about Jesus this morning, and I was thinking about the fact that He was the Son of the living God. And, and, and in this passage of Scripture, He even spoke about the fact that you've never seen Him and you've never heard Him. And, and, and Jesus is... Jesus is the manifestation. The scripture teaches us in Colossians that he is the express image of God. He is the image of the invisible God. Had God the Father, I've been saying this for a long time in my heart, or at least I've tried to say it at times when I preach, but I really didn't understand. I don't even know that I understand it now, but I know it to be true. Had God never sent Jesus, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know anything more about God. We would be so clueless about God. And yet even still, we try to learn of God through the scripture. And it's so hard because it seems so distant sometimes. <clears throat> and I'm thinking about Jesus and I'm thinking about the fact that he had revelation. It was, I believe it was a growing revelation, a growing understanding of who God the Father was. You got to understand this. Jesus, when he was born in the manger, did not have the full revelation of the Father. When Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes in the manger, he does not have full revelation of who he is, and he does not have full revelation of his father. And we know this to be true because the scripture says that he grew in wisdom and stature. And we also know that, that you know, the, the Holy Spirit speaking to him, but we also know that even when Elijah and Moses, in one of the accounts of the gospel, it says that they spoke to him more about what he was going to experience in Jerusalem. So Jesus was progressively understanding what he was going to go through. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm seeing in here, he says, I seek not my own will. I seek the will of the one who sent me. And, and, and the word seek means to desire, to crave, to search after. And the scripture says in Mark 1 35 that Jesus long before the break of day would get alone in a solitary place. And there he would pray. And he's seeking the father. And he's desiring to know the Father's will. And through Jesus, you and I can come to know the Father. And only through Jesus will we ever know God. Amen. And I feel as though that the Lord just wanted me to start off by saying, even though I wasn't going to focus on this scripture, that we must seek him. We must seek the will of God. We must seek the person of God. We must seek the heart of God to know him. And, and I just wanted to encourage you with that this morning. To seek the Lord. Amen. So Jesus in the years. In one of the verses in verse 41 of the John 5 that we read. Jesus said this statement. He said, I do not receive glory from people. So I'm going to be starting a little mini series on John chapter 6. And this is really just an introductory context to get there. But where Jesus said that, he said, I do not receive glory from people. Take a look at John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, because the title of that caption in my Bible on the ESV says, Jesus knows what is in man. He said, I do not receive glory from people. And in this passage of scripture, it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the sign <coughs> that he was doing. That, that first little sentence right there, I was kind of reading behind some scholars a couple of weeks ago, and it said the idea behind it is, we're of Jesus's party. You know, some people say I'm Republican or I'm Democrat. It's like there was a lot of political different things going on, a lot of different sects and different divisions of in the society. It's people who start to say, hey, we're with him. We're with that rabbi right there. He's our rabbi, he's our teacher. But look what Jesus says. It says, well, look what it says about Jesus. It says, at the, at, now he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. I got to be honest with you, when I, when I preach this, I want so badly to have the heart of the Lord on this, but because I don't want to misrepresent the Lord, I don't want to misrepresent his word, and I don't want to misrepresent his heart when it comes to his word. And, but I need you to understand that Jesus, I believe this with all of my heart, when he rode into Jerusalem on the week before he was crucified, 
And then, and he said, if they don't, if they, if they don't cry out, then the rocks are going to cry out. Jesus on the, on the back of that donkey knows that the same people that are throwing palm trees and palm branches down before me today to give me a road to walk upon are the same ones that are going to scream for my crucifixion in a week from now. Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in my heart. And my cry, my prayer of late has been, Lord, please put his heart in me. And the more I pray that way and the more I see things transition in my life, the more I realize I really need his heart in me. And the closer I get to him, the, real, the more I realize the further away from his heart that I am. Yeah. The word in trust is the same word that's used in the New Testament for believe, to have faith in. It's used repeatedly. Basically, Jesus is saying, the scripture is saying Jesus did not have faith in man. Jesus is saying he did not have faith in man because he knew what was in the heart of man. So he did not commit himself to man. How do I learn as a believer and as a minister of the gospel? I think that this is important this morning. But how do I learn not to entrust myself while truly forgiving 490 times. How do I learn to not expect you to do to me anything different than other human beings would do to me? Or how do I learn not to expect you not to do to me the very things that I've done to others? Come on, somebody. Help me out here. And at the same time, love like Jesus loved. I'm going to read this scripture to you real quick out of John 6. It says a large crowd was following him. Why? Because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. I think it's very important that we start to understand. People will follow the Lord. They will run after the Lord because of signs and wonders. But their heart. And listen, it's going to be proven out in the scripture. When it's all said and done, you may not be here when I preach the last sermon, but the last sermon on this little series is at the very end of John 6, and most of you know the story. But this is the beginning of the story. The beginning of the story is that we're told it's the longest chapter in the New Testament. And in the beginning of the story, we're told exactly why they are going after him. We're told exactly why they are seeking after him. And in the end of the story, we know what happens when he tells them that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. What do they do? They depart. They depart and they leave him. And it says that when they saw what he was doing, the signs he was doing on the sick, that they, that they went after him. And he went upon a mountain. There he sat. It was the feast of the Passover. Lifting up his eyes, seeing the large crowd was coming toward him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to perform this miracle. But listen, Mark 6 tells us something a little bit different. You don't have to turn there, but I just want to say this because I wasn't going to read it. But I want you to know that Mark 6 tells the same story. Jesus feeds the 5,000. And they, they're seeking after him. They're, the disciples have come back from their missionary journey. The people are hearing the story of what they're doing. They're seeing what Jesus is doing. They're coming out from all of these towns. They're going after him on foot. And, 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 and when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And you know, the scripture says he had compassion on them. In spite of the fact that Jesus knows. The reason that I read John 2 the end of John 2 is because I want you, I want us to understand that the writer, the Holy Spirit through the writer is wanting us to understand that Jesus already has this in his mind and in his heart but for the rest of the story. He already knows what's in the heart of man. He already knows what to expect from man. He already knows that man is going to nail him to the cross. He already knows that people are going to betray him. He already knows what's going to happen to his disciples. He already knows that they're going to leave him and forsake him. And yet Jesus still loves with a heart of compassion. He sees them. And he, but you know what the scripture says? Not, it, is, it doesn't say that he had compassion on them because their belt, because their tummies were growling. It doesn't say that. It says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. 
And when it grew late, his disciples said, how are we going to feed them? And, and, the, and the Lord, you know, the, the rest of the story. So in the intro of this, I, I want you to know I'm going to be preaching a couple of messages. And before we get to that, this was the context. It's essential to that chapter into our lives as Christians and my life as a minister of the gospel. That we understand some things. I believe this. I believe it's so important for you as believers. Because one of the things that I've learned as I've been serving the Lord for a little time now. Is that you're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. And what the enemy wants to do in your pain. Is he wants to turn you on other believers. That's right. He wants to turn you against church. He wants to turn you against Jesus. And he won't tell you that he's turning you against Jesus because in your mind you're like I'll never turn on Jesus because Jesus never turned on me and you mean that when you say that because you love him because you wouldn't be in church this morning if you didn't but he's he's much slicker than that he comes in and he causes like a little root of something a little seed of something to be planted on the inside of the heart and self loves to let it fester and it sits there and it causes this Thing to take place in our heart and if we don't allow it to be dealt with if we don't recognize it church and we don't bring it to the Lord it will do the very thing we don't want it to do it's going to turn us it's going to separate us from, from Christ in, in a way spiritually and, and that we may even just be able to go through the motions of what we're doing and continue to look okay on the outside but in reality there's something going on in there that's not right. The Lord wants us to be aware of this and he wants to he wants to minister because he has compassion on them, he has compassion on you, he has compassion on me. Yeah. He has compassion on all of us. Amen. And and you know sometimes this is just kind of coming to me but Many times back whenever I was, uh, I remember we went to a, a, a Bible college camp whenever Christopher and the Bible college I went to. And then we had, y'all had that volleyball thing out there by the little. And I can remember, because I was a pretty, well, I was a mess. And I can remember telling the other church team on the other side of the net, we're going to win because the Lord's on our side. <laughs> Isn't that strange? Like, that's so like, so the Lord's not on their side? <laughs> I mean, they love God. And the only reason I said that is an illustration, because sometimes we think yes. whenever people do us wrong, man, the Lord's going to get you. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the reality of it is, is that maybe the Lord's trying to teach you something. Yeah. <laughs> maybe the Lord's trying to teach me something. Yeah. Whenever we're going through things and we and we view this, and it's like, how dare you? How dare they? How, how dare this happen? And the Lord's like, maybe I'm doing something in you. See? And we get so focused on the offense. I'm going to preach that one time because it just hit me the other day. It's like a football game. Offense, defense. Yes. We get offended and the next thing you know, we're going on defense. Yeah. That's it for another time. But it's important for us to know. See, Jesus knows the heart of the people around him. He knows that the people in this story are seeking him more for what he can do for them rather than who he is. That's, that's the reality of the text. They're seeking him more for what he can do for them than for he, who he is. Yet he has compassion for them. And, is, and look at this. He's not moved off course by their actions. I want to be like Jesus. I'm telling you right now, I want to be like the, I want to be like him. He's not moved off course by their actions. Jesus knows his father's will. He knows his purpose on earth. He understands that his earthly existence is temporary. Do you understand that this morning? Yep. And that his work here will have eternal value. And we are connected to this story in a similar way. We are on earth temporarily. And within that time, listen, I believe this is true. The foundation of our eternal purpose is laid. Yep. I could go on on that. I could expound on that. But I want you to know that in this temporary moment of your existence, a big part of this temporary part, this vapor of your life, it will affect eternity. It's, it's written throughout the scripture. It's going to affect your eternity. 
This temporary world that we're navigating and that we get ourselves hurt and we're getting offended and we're allowing these things to affect us and it's affecting our personalities and it's affecting the way that we think and the way that we engage this world that we're living in. I'm here to tell you it's temporary and the way we respond is going to affect our eternity because it could affect the work that God has called us to do. And when I say the work, I don't know what your work is called to do. Yeah, every church always needs help with teaching kids and cleaning. and uh, That's not even what I'm talking about. That might be part of it. But I'm talking about living for Jesus. Yeah. I'm talking about bringing glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one that is seated at the right hand of the Father. The one that is full of splendor and glory and honor. The one that the Father, when he looks at him, he sees his beloved son. He sees the wounds. In his body. And he says, this is my beloved. This is the one that I am well pleased. This is the one that always did what I had for him to do. That's the one. That's what I'm talking about. That's what this is about. And if somebody says it's not, then they're not telling the truth. This is about Jesus. Even in the song that we sang, angels bow. How did, how did it go? Just say no, no. The angels. The angels, bow before him. Him. Angels, bow before him. Him. angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. The angels were created by him and for him. Everything that he created exists to give him glory and honor. You were created by him and for him and your life purpose is to bring him glory and honor. And most of us, starting with Pastor Matt, are going to spend the majority of our life getting hurt, getting offended, getting caught off guard, getting caught off course, and, and going in directions that the Lord never intended for us to do. Good news, good news. He's a healer. He's a reconciler. He's a restorer. Amen. And he will pick you up. He will restore you. He will heal you. He will speak to you. And he will still use you. Moses, David, Amen. Peter, he will still use you in spite of all of that. Hey, he's a good God. Amen. Huh? But you need to know that the enemy is after you. He's got a mark on you. The foundation of our eternal purpose is laid on this temporary side. Like Jesus, we will encounter humans who will act and say one thing, but in their hearts. They have other plans. Sadly, the scripture says that we are more like them than him. But we still desperately need the church. And I want to say this. The Holy Spirit is committed to the work of the ongoing circumcision of the Christian heart. I want to say that again. The Holy Spirit is committed to the work of the ongoing circumcision of the Christian heart. He doesn't circumcise the heart of the world. He doesn't circumcise the heart of the unregenerated or the heart of the unconverted. He, he's committed to circumcising the heart of the believer. Those that have been converted, those that have Christ birthed in their heart, this, the Jesus seed. <laughs> has been planted in their heart and is growing and he's, he's pruning and he's circumcising. I know the theological doctrine behind it, but how do I really let the Holy Spirit have his way in fashioning the Jesus on the pages in my heart? So with that said, I got two main thoughts today. What should I expect from this human encounter? Not really. What should I expect from these ears that I'm talking to today? From you? From the guy yesterday at the clinic? From whoever's going to be on Monday that I run into? What should I expect from the ears that are hearing what I'm saying? What should Because the, the Lord knew what he was dealing with. But number two, how can I get this man in my heart? <laughs> how can I get this man's heart in my heart? The man, the God man, Christ Jesus. How do I get his heart in my heart is what I'm asking. 
He said it in John 5. He said, his voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. You do not have his word abiding in you. I know he's not talking to you. I don't think so. He's talking to the religious leaders. I understand that. Don't get offended. Not on this part anyway, right? For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. And look at this. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that ye may have life. And then he said, I don't receive glory for people. And I was thinking a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, as I've been reading the scripture over and over again, talking to people about it. And I was thinking, you know, all for so long now, I've been feverishly turning these pages of scripture. I'm telling you, man, if, it, if this was what it looked like over the last 20 something years of my life. I mean, this is what it would be. It's like I'm feverishly turning these pages of scripture and looking on them and highlighting them and, and writing and Staying in the other sides of the pages and writing down in notebooks and, and all of these things. And, and it's like I'm seeing it on the page of the scripture. But I question how much of that has entered into my heart. I'm just being real. And I want you to know that Jesus is speaking to a whole lot of different groups of people and throughout these stories that we'll be looking at. And so I just wanted this is the ears part of the message. First off, the world. So I want you to understand so that we're not confused on who we're talking to, the world. What I want to say about the world is that they're not saved. And as far as they're concerned, they're not interested in the things of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says the God of this world has blinded their eyes, has blinded their minds. They can't see. But look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. Let's take a look at that real quick. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's the enemy of your soul, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Yes, yes. Oh, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So when we're talking about the world, and listen, I've shared this story before. One time I was out at the shrimp fest and I was like, hey, man, I think the Lord wanted me to tell you specifically about Jesus. He's like, yeah, Jesus, mom told me about the Easter bunny and Santa too. Not interested. And, you know, sometimes whenever people would say something like that to me, maybe I would get offended because here we go again, the offense. But what did I expect? Right. Did I expect everybody to embrace? And you know what I'll say? He deserves to hear the good news about Jesus. And he deserves for my heart to stay soft towards him and to still pray for him. Because such was I. Yeah. Such were you. Such were we. They still, even though they're the unredeemed, even though they're of the world, even though they may go to their graves not loving the Jesus that we love, they still have a right to hear the good news yeah. about Jesus. Then there's the crowd. These are the ones that are seeking after him with the sign, but they're the ones that are going to leave him. <laughs> they aren't saved. But look, you know what about the crowd? They're interested enough to listen. They're interested in what he has to say, and they really like what he can do for them. And as long as he's doing what they want, and he's saying what they like, they're in. But when that changes, they change. Now, we're talking about Jesus is talking right now. We're talking about what Jesus does. We're not talking about Pastor Matt. Pastor Matt wants his best to preach Jesus from the scripture. But we understand that Pastor Matt's not Jesus. But what we are trying to say is this, is that there's people that are interested and they really like what he can do for them. And as long as he's doing what they want and he's saying what they like, they're in. But when that changes, they change. And this is what we call in the modern church the seeker sensitives. Amen. 
These people are welcome to come and hear what the Lord would say. And I'm saying this. I'm saying this to, 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 to people that would come to our church. I'm saying this to anybody that would ever watch this video. The, those people, the crowd, are welcome in the house of God. At least they're welcome in this house. But you know what they're not welcome to do? They're not welcome to change the message so that we can try to make them stay. Amen. We're not going to change the message to try to make seek sensitive people that are looking for Jesus so that they'll just stay. That's not, no, that's not what I mean. That, listen, there's a whole church world out there that believes that that's the way it's supposed to be done. That's not what I'm hearing from the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. That's right. The, the crowd is there as long as he's feeding them what they want, but when he tries to feed them what he came to bring, they don't want it anymore. And so what's going to happen to preachers that are building it based on numbers and, and building it based on however they do church growth nowadays and they stand before the Lord and they give an account because they thought they were doing good because they're, they're judging their productivity and they're judging their success the way we judge capitalism and free enterprise based upon the corporation model. You, you must have done something really good because you're church. Now listen, don't get me wrong now. If the church is filled because the Holy Spirit's showing up and there's signs and there's wonder, there's still the crowd. It's still the crowd. They might be seeking for the wrong thing. But what's really supposed to be happening is that the Lord's moving in our life. And he's changing us in our heart. And Christ is being formed and fashioned in us. So they're welcome. But the service of the message can't be changed to make them stay. And then there's the spiritually proud. We're just talking about the ears real quick. We're moving through. They're blind. The spiritually proud. Listen to me, church. And you know what's interesting to me is that I'm pretty sure that I've been all of these things. Yeah. <laughs> and if I've been all of these things, that means you've been all of these yeah. things. Because <laughs> such were some of you. We may not like to hear that, but it's just reality. The spiritually proud, they're blind and they can't see, but they think they can. Amen. And they have all the answers. The spiritually proud has all the answers. And, and guess what? I know I've been this dude. <laughs> and no one else knows what they know. And if you don't like, if you don't do it the way that they think it should be done, then you're wrong and they will believe that it's their job to stop you. Yeah. And we have to be careful, though. Listen, we have to be careful how we treat the religiously proud. Because, see, I'm going back to the fact that Jesus does have compassion. And you know what the Lord is showing me? He's saying, I spoke to you back in 2001. This is what this is new revelation for, Pat, for Brother Matt. I spoke to you in 2001 in a barroom bathroom. I said that you will present my work for the way that it's written. You will lay your life down, present my work for the way it's written, then I will use you. Recently, he spoke to me. He said, you have allowed me to some extent to teach you what my word says, but you're still not presenting my word for the way it's written because you're not looking at my heart in the way that it was spoken. So what the Lord's revealing to me is that not only does he have to do a work in my heart to open in my eyes to where I can even see theologically what he's trying to say. I have to come to the realization that he has to do a work in my heart that I would present it from the heart of Jesus. And whenever I say present it from the heart of Jesus, I'm here to tell you, my friend, Jesus isn't always quite as he's not always quite as meek and mild as what we play him out to be. As a matter of fact, all we got to do is read the way that he speaks. And we can see it. But, but anyway, but he's but it's always doing what is right. That's the thing. He's always doing what is right for the heart, for the human. He's always doing what is right because it's the Father's will. So the spiritually proud, they don't, they, they think they have all the answers. Um, they think that they know everything. And they think that and, and if you don't do it the way they think they should, that it should be done, then they're going to try to stop you. Right. And, and, and I just was saying that we have to be careful with these people, too, because not only were you and I that or we might be that right now. But you know who else was that? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And maybe you have to go back and you have to read the story. But these are two religious Pharisees that somewhere along the journey, Jesus entered their heart. And I was trying, I was in my prayer closet, I shared it with the Bible study last week, I'm not going to try to go through all that again, but I can't even really put words to it, but it was almost like I could see it. These religious men and, and all of their religious 
wardrobe and all of their cleanliness and he said and you know what Jesus would say to them you Pharisees you wash the outside of the cup and the inside is full of filth and everything that they did when everything you do is to be seen by men he would save them you love your whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones make the outside of the cup look good but the inside and they would sit there and they would wash their hands and they would be all pious and you know we, we, we've been called of the Lord we're of the Lord and they walk around in these flowing robes and, and they like to make broad their phylacteries and this is who these men were and somewhere along the way yes. I can see them fumbling and stumbling at the foot of the cross and they're about to make themselves unclean ceremonially unclean and they're not going to be able to take of the Passover because they're about to touch the dead body of Jesus and maybe they had servants to do it. I don't know. And this is all speculation. But I can see him fumbling and stumbling. And we got to get him down. All we got to get him down before the buzzards get him. We got to get him down. We got to prepare his body for burial. And they're touching the body of our Lord, the wounded body of our Lord. And all of this stuff is getting on. They, they handled it. And, and I'm just saying, like, like, that's what my prayer in the prayer closet, whenever the Lord began to show me that, Lord, this would become a spiritual reality to me. That I would handle the wounded body of our Lord spiritually. That, that, that what he's done for me would enter my heart and that it would affect me. And that it'd be all over me. And that I wouldn't be the same because of it. And that I would understand that it was because of me that he had to do this. And that, and that I have not arrived. And that you need him as bad as I need him and that the world needs him and that the, the world that's unsaved needs him and that the seekers need him and that and that the spiritually proud need him and, and that and that we, we, we just all need him so bad yeah. so good. and then there's the disciples they're the learners of the Lord and you know they don't know everything but there have been times in the past that they sure thought they did <laughs> can I get an amen amen but the Lord has rebuked and chastened them. Straight up, get behind me, Satan. You savor not the things of God, but the things of man. He told Peter that. He called Peter Satan. Now, you want to get offended? Lord, well, I'm not going to follow him anymore. He called me Satan. They've been corrected and they're still with him. As a matter of fact, correction, I'm talking about in John 6 when we get to the end. As a matter of fact, correction and chastening never stops for them because the goal is Jesus fashioned in the heart. <laughs> Let me just say that to you, Christian. It's never going to stop. The chastening of the Lord, if you are a true believer of Christ, That's right. the chastening of the Lord is never going to stop. And can, I do, can you do me a favor? I see a couple of people writing notes. Can you write this down? The next time something happens to you that offends you, stop and look in the mirror first. This is something that the Lord's taught me and I'm still not getting it like I'm supposed to. You understand? The Lord told me this 10 years ago and I'm still struggling with it. Son, every time you're offended, stop and look in the mirror or ask, what are you showing me, Lord? Instead of looking at that person that hurt your feelings, that you think did you dirty... They, listen, they belong, if they belong to the Lord, He's going to deal with them. The question is, what are you speaking to me? Because I need you to work with me. Yeah. Amen? Amen? They're going to get corrected more, and they're still going to remain with Him, at least those that are His real disciples. Peter, the sons of thunder, Thomas. Jesus is going to correct them. And he's going to rebuke him. He's committed to it. He's committed to correcting you. He's committed to correcting you. And you know what that means? It means he loves us. That's what the scripture says in Hebrews 12. It says the, the Lord chases those whom he loves. He, he's going to bring correction because he loves us and he's going to discipline us. So that was the first thing. Those were the ears. I just wanted you to know who you're talking to. Number two, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He's the light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Amen. 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 I just can't say his name enough. I love Jesus, man. Because he first loved me. 
I wish I could, no, I don't wish that, because then I wouldn't understand it. I'm just thankful that he woke me up one morning and he showed me that he loved me. Yes. I'm thankful that he drew me by his spirit. Yes. You, you didn't come into this place confused this morning and thought you woke up one morning and that you just fell in love with Jesus, did you? You understand that he moved on you first? That's right. You understand that he drew you by his spirit, that he, he loved you so much. He came to rescue you, my friend. Amen. Uh, he's not done with you. Amen. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. As I was showing you, like searching through the scriptures, I was just thinking, you know, searching but not finding. Finding doctrine, but not the man. He's not doctrine. Oh, he's the doctrine. And without the doctrine, I don't know him. Because if without the doctrine, I don't know that the veil was ripped. Without the doctrine, I don't, I don't know that it was out of his side that he produced the bride. Because it's consistent with Genesis chapter 3. Or ch chapter 2, whenever he put Adam to sleep, I don't, without the doctrine, I don't understand that the veil was ripped, that which was his flesh that was ripped for me. That like on the day of atonement, now I can enter in because the way has been made. And that not only that high priest can go in, but I can go in. Without the doctrine, I don't know what he's done for me. But I can know all the doctrine and I cannot know the man. Because if I never enter in, even though he made the way. Why? Because there's just so much stuff to do. Yeah. There's so much stuff. And I never enter in and I know I'm sorry. I'm not no, I'm not sorry. I'm not going to be sorry to talk about intimacy with the Lord. I'm not talking about prayer time in order to try to earn something with God. That's ridiculous. I'm not talking about fasting in order to try to earn something with God. That's legalism and law. That's no different than circumcision regarding the Galatians. I'm talking about the fact that Jesus died on the cross and that the veil was split and that you can pray to God your Father through His Son Jesus. Amen. I'm here to talk about why would we not avail ourselves to the presence of the Lord? Why would we not soften ourselves in His presence? Why would we not thank Him whenever it's just you and I to alone with Him? Why would we not take the time? I'm not saying that you don't. I, I don't know your personal prayer life. I know that there's been times in my life that I haven't. Right, right. Why, why would we not? Make it real to us, Lord. Finding doctrine, but not the man. Finding truth, but not the truth. How do I find him or know him? I know about his heart. I, I know about his heart. I got to read about it in this text. I got to find out how he's going to respond. That he's going to have compassion on people even when he knows what they're going to do to him. And I read this about this, this God man that was revealed, that was manifest so that I could see the heart of the Father. I read this about him and, and I see that this is who he is and now I have to have him in me. You understand what I'm trying to get at? I hope you get what I'm saying. How do I get his heart in me? A place where I treat people the way he treats me. Despite how I treat him and despite how they treat me, how do I treat them the way he treats me? That We're all on the same page. That's not always too easy. Just want to make sure I wasn't doing it. The place where I go from selfish to selfless, from self-absorbed to self-denied. He's a person. The doctrine is so good. It tells me that he made the way. He moved on me and he wants me to move closer to him. And he tells me that if I will move closer to the him, that he will move closer to me. He says that in his word. James says it. Draw near the Lord and he will draw near to you. He's made the first move and the question is, will we respond? Unless I'm willing to know him intimately, he remains words on a page and not the resurrected Lord in my heart. And once I begin to see him on these pages and I realize that I need him in my heart, will I be willing to allow him to be fashioned in me? Will, will I be willing to endure the pain and the heartache of the fashioning when I realize how much I don't look like him? How much I don't love like him? 
Well, I still want it then. Well, I still want him then. Well, well, I, well, I still want the forming and the fashioning to continue even when it hurts more than I expected. Well, I still want him to have his way in me even when I'm not getting what I want. It's a good question. He became flesh to free me so I could be intimate with him, but how will I know him? He is a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And part of knowing him is part with that. Philippians 3.10 says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I don't know about you, but I want to I wanna know the power of his resurrection. Because in the power of his resurrection, there's victory, <coughs> there's healing, there's power, there's anointing. There's all the things that are needed in order for others to be able to see the goodness of God. Look what it says. That I, know, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I, can I be real with you? I hope I say this the right way because I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm not. In, I'm really not interested in having in in being this great minister. I'm not real interested in in anything other than really being made conformable to his death. I keep looking back at that scripture that says that there's going to be people on that day that are going to say, "Lord, Lord, we knew you. We casted out devils. We healed the sick. We we did all of these things." And he's going to say, "I didn't even know you." And I keep saying this because it's, I think it's important for us to understand. It, it does say that he never knew them. Clear? Yes. Right. So many of you are saying, well, that means it wasn't me. All I'm trying to say is this, is that they thought they knew him. They called him Lord, Lord. I'm not saying, and, and, and the reality of it is, is that you, we should know whether we're in him or not. The scripture tells us, the scripture says that whenever you believed in the one whom you heard being preached about, I'm paraphrasing, but Ephesians 1.13 says this, that when you heard the gospel of truth, when you heard the truth and you received it by faith and you were sealed with the spirit of God, that means that the Holy Spirit came to live. This is theology. This is doctrine. The Bible says when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your heart. Yes. That means that you, we ought to be getting changed. Amen. And whenever I say we ought to be getting changed, I'm not talking about you hunkering it down and doing it in your own strength. Amen. But I'm talking about you coming to the realization, me coming to the realization that there's things in my life and in my heart that don't line up with the word of God. And when they don't, that I would yield to him. And that I would surrender to him. And that I would go to him. And that I'd cry out to him. And that I'd recognize that he split the veil so that I could enter in. And that I would be made conformable unto his, unto his death. That's right. and, that, and, and that I would allow him to have his way in me. You know what the word yield means? It means to... It means to... Well, let me get, let me get in. I'm closing with this last scripture right here. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Some of the words that are used to describe present. See, when he's saying your bodies, he's saying that your body is a vessel. The Holy Spirit's looking for a vessel. He's looking for a body that he can live in and that he can work through. Not everybody's going to stand behind the pulpit. Most of you don't even really want to. Right? But the Holy Spirit is still looking for a body to live in and to, to love through and to speak through, to speak truth through and, and to pray for others and to minister to others. Amen? Amen. And the word present your body, the word, one of the words that's used, a couple of words is yield, proffer. I like that word proffer. I read it somewhere else. I heard, I heard a preacher say the other day, uh, uh, a proffered hand 
in a man that's drowning, he should not really receive any honor, right? In other words, like we want to take so much credit in our own life for our salvation sometimes. You know, we're like, yeah, I'm a good dude. Oh, look at me. I'm doing all this. I'm not saying you feel that way, but many times we get puffed up in our mind. And he's saying, a proffered hand in the dr drowning man that he might be saved ought to not really let know. That's what you're going to do. Help, Lord! Yes. Proffer yourself. Yield yourself. Present yourself unto the Lord and it's kind of like it's kind of like you get down on your knee and you say for your use my Lord for, for your use my Lord I present my body to you not my I'm not going to present to do my own thing my own way but no for your use my Lord here to be your servant to let you have your way. Beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you would present your body a living sacrifice. See, what I'm trying to say is that this is where the two places meet. This is part of understanding how do I get this man in my heart. This is part of understanding how do I get him off the pages and into my heart. Where is this place of intersection take place where I become conformable unto his death? Where I become part of his suffering? How do I let the sufferings in the real world begin to affect me to make me realize that I haven't always been right. I haven't always done it right. And yet I've allowed offenses and I've allowed things that have come against me to build up a wall. All. Every, listen, I'm not trying to get psychological, but I'm going to keep using this word psychological because it's the word for the soul in the Greek language. And I'm not backing off because it's your mind, your will, and your emotions, and they have been affected by your past life. They have been affected by the way people have treated you. And if you're not careful, you will still allow it to affect you today. And you can say that you've gotten past your rejection things. And you've gotten past your daddy issues and your mommy issues. And I'm not trying to bring you back to your past. Because the Jesus I know, they heal you in one moment of time. But you've got to bring yourself to him. You've got to proffer yourself to him. You have to yield yourself to him. And you've got to let him heal you. Yes. And as long as you go around here thinking that it's everybody else and it ain't not got nothing to do with you, you, we, we, we will not be here. We're going to keep fighting against it. Help us, Lord. See, I don't know about you, but I'm on, that, well, on that day, on, you know, let me just be clear on this. On that day when I see him, if I'm going to be happy, it's only going to be because of him. Yes. It's only going to be because of him and his blood, his sacrifice. It's his righteousness that's getting us in. Does that make sense? Yes. It's not like you did all, all this stuff, right? And he's like, oh, that boy did a pretty good job. Man. We're going to let him in now. <laughs> it's, it's really so much all about him. I heard a preacher say the other day. It's like, you know, we, we get so caught up in ourselves, yes, right? Yes. And, and preachers will get caught up in it, not so much in people like me. <laughs> but some of these people, they got some serious stuff going on. They get so caught up in themselves. Like, you know, or they'll think a certain way about themselves. And I remember somebody was saying, you know, whenever we get to glory and we're all walking on the streets of gold, I can promise you this. I won't be running up to, and I'm, if I say anybody's name, let me use Nye. I think Nye. I won't be running up to everybody and saying, hey, y'all should, let me tell you about what Naya did. <laughs> well, let me tell you about what Naya did for the Lord when she was on earth and how she sang glory, glory in that service. And the Lord said, we're not going to be talking about Naya. We're just not. I mean, thank you, Naya. Please don't quit coming. But we're not going to be talking about Naya. <laughs> We're not going to be talking about Pastor Matt or Al. You know, I don't know. It's going to be Jesus. He's going to be like, hey, come see me. Look at him all what he did. He's so beautiful. He's so awesome. Jesus. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Scripture says that when I got saved, he gave me the mind of Christ. I need your mind so desperately, Lord. I need to think like you. I need to love like you. I need to understand like you, Lord God. To be able to preach the way you preach, to speak the truth, and yet at the same time have, the, have what's best in the heart of man in mind. That I wouldn't take offense and... 
that I wouldn't hurt, but that I love the way you love and that I tell the truth. Teach us your ways. Thank you, Lord. Maybe the singers and the musicians can come.